Okay, so in this lecture, I want to talk a bit more about what Rawls' second principle of justice, the one that's supposed to govern inequality, that's supposed to state what inequality society should allow. I want to say more about what it means. So I said last time, Rawls' second principle says inequalities have to satisfy two conditions. Um, they have to allow for real equality of opportunity, and the least well-off person must be as well-off as possible. Now, in the interview, uh, Dworkin really doesn't talk about the first one here. He kind of focuses on the second one. But I think the first one is also important to discuss. Um, so I'm going to say a bit more about it, and then we'll move into the second part of the second principle. So let's start with talking about real equality of opportunity. So Rawls contrasts real equality of opportunity with what he calls merely formal equality of opportunity. So what does he mean by this? And, and, and I think seeing what Rawls means by this will help us to understand what um, real equality of opportunity is supposed to mean. So if there's form of society has formal equality of opportunity, it means there's no legal bar on what professions or roles you can occupy in society because of religion, gender, race, social class, family background. Now you can think of societies that actually don't have formal equality of opportunity. Um, Medieval Europe, for instance, was a society without formal equality of opportunity. If you were born a peasant, there were a lot of roles in society you couldn't occupy. If you were Jewish instead of Christian, there were most roles in society, most professions were barred to you, right? Medieval Europe is a society without formal equality of opportunity. But Rawls thinks from the original position, you would choose more than merely formal opportunity, formal equality of opportunity. Well, why is that? Well, think about it this way, right? Why isn't formal equality of opportunity enough? In 1944, there were no legal bars on a woman or an African-American becoming president, right? What, even if you guys don't know your history, you can guess what the president who was elected in 1944 is going to look like, right? He is going to be a white guy, right? Same goes for other professions, right? If you were a woman in 1944 or even before, let's say, like 1914, 1910, you know, most places there wasn't a legal bar, a legal restriction that said you could become a doctor. I don't know that there were anywhere, right? But it was practically impossible for most women to become doctors, even if they had the talent and ability at that time, right? So Rawls would say, you know, formal equality of opportunity, it isn't nothing. You can think of some societies that don't even have that, right? You know, medieval Europe, for example. But it doesn't go far enough. Think back to the original position. You might come out and find that you are really talented, but there are, due to bias, there are obstacles against you achieving the profession you want, right? Or you might be really talented, but just really poor, right? Your parents don't make enough money to pay for medical school or whatever, right? Because that's a possibility, you would want more than formal equality of opportunity from the original position. Rawls would say you would want real equality of opportunity. What is real equality of opportunity? Real equality of opportunity means that only talent and willingness to work hard should determine your prospects in any career. Two people with the same relevant talents 
and the same willingness to work hard ought to have the same chances for success in that career. Um, so, and it's important that we don't um, confuse what Rawls means, right? It's important that we be clear on what real equality of opportunity really is. Rawls is not saying that everybody ought to have exactly the same chances for success. Th that, that would be a stupid position, right? You know, my, my hands shake a little bit. It runs in my family. Um, I shouldn't be a surgeon, right? I shouldn't have any chance being a surgeon because my hands shake, right? You know, you can think of other things, right? But what Rawls is saying, if you have the relevant talent, if you have steady hands and the smarts to make it through medical school, you ought to have the same chance of being a surgeon as anybody else with the same talent and same willingness to work hard. If you don't have the relevant talents, then of course we shouldn't make incompetent people surgeons or airline pilots or engineers or whatever. But if you have the talent and you're willing to work, you ought to have the same chance of success as anybody else. So I just say this because oftentimes people will try to make roles or the quality of opportunity principle into something stupid. It's not, right? You have to, you have to pay attention to the relevant talents part and the willingness to work hard part. Now look, I mean, already the real equality of opportunity principle is a really radical principle. We would have to rethink a lot in our society to even implement this principle of real equality of opportunity. I mean, think of all the ways that our society falls short. You know, I'll give you guys one instance, right? Th think of the huge differences in schools, right? If you don't know, um, American schools are largely financed through property taxes. Well, you know, what does that mean? It means a poor neighborhood, less money for the schools. Rich neighborhood, more money for the schools. So in an indirect way, the amount of money that you can pay for a house determines how good an education your children will get. You know, that is not, if people in a poor neighborhood because they have worse schools, for that very reason have worse chances of success than equally talented, equally hardworking people in the rich neighborhood, that's not real equality of opportunity. Another one you guys should know about, because I think it's just so completely scandalous, is that a lot of colleges like Harvard, Yale, um, UVA, William & Mary, UC Berkeley, that have competitive admissions have what they call the so-called legacy system, right? Um, that means that if your parents went there, they actually have lower admission standards. It's much easier for you to get in. So again, you know, because of the role these places play in who succeeds in our society, that's another way that our society doesn't fit with this real equality of opportunity principle. Um, you know, I, I'm going to put a question on the quiz about this because I think it's important you know, think about some other ways that we fail to meet this real equality of opportunity principle. Um, you know, to even achieve this, we would have to do a lot. It's a pretty radical principle. But anyway, I'm going to leave the real equality of opportunity principle behind to get to the second part of Rawls' second principle of justice. And the second part is really the most controversial part. Um, a lot of people like the real equality of opportunity principle, but for many people, the second part goes too far, right? It's even more radical, even stronger. What does the second part of the second principle of justice say? The second part of the second principle of justice is the so-called difference principle. And what the difference principle says 
is that the least well-off person must be as well-off as possible. Is your society, are the inequalities it allows justified? Well, one, you have to have real equality of opportunity, but once you have that, you look at the poorest possible person in society. The poorest people in society, are they as well off as they could be? Well, to, to see how this works, let's take a really simplified example. This is my sort of, it's very crude, it's very oversimplified, but let's look at this you know, example, how this might work. Okay, so Rawls would say, you know, in our fictional society, we have three groups, poor, middle, rich, and we have these four possible distributions, right? You know, one, two, three, four, as we go across. Well, if you were Rawls, which one would you pick? Well, if you were Rawls, you only need to look at the top line, right? And look, these numbers mean nothing. I mean, I just, I was sitting at my computer. I came up with them. They're just random numbers I picked to make this clear, right? You would have to choose number three because if you're Rawls, you don't look beyond the first line. You look at what the poorest of the poor are earning, what they're making in society, right? Is society just? Well, three is because there's no other possible arrangement where the poorest of the poor could be doing any better. All right, so hopefully you guys understand what this difference principle is. Okay, so hopefully I've presented the basics of Rawls' argument. Um, so in the next lecture, I want to talk about some objections to Rawls and how Rawls might respond. But I think before we do that, we should just take a minute to see why Rawls' argument is interesting, why it's important. You know, you might think, okay, well, Rawls has played this little game and showed, you know, that we would choose these principles from this hypothetical situation. Well, why is that important? Well, I think it's important because Rawls has done something pretty interesting from our political perspective. He's, he's really contributed to our political debates. Um, and think about this, right? There's a common position on the left that too much inequality is a bad thing and that, that inequality in itself stands in need of some justification. Um, you'll often hear Bernie Sanders argue in these terms, right? People who are associated with Sanders who share the same position, right? You know, they'll say, well, you know, the 1% or whatever percent of the population owns some huge percentage of our wealth. Isn't that unfair, right? And the very idea here seems to be that, you know, certain distributions by being really unequal are unfair in and of themselves. You know, and when you listen to guys like Sanders, they, they'll reel off these figures. They don't tend to give much argument, you know, that this is a bad thing. You're just supposed to recognize, oh, okay, this, this level of inequality isn't good. What's interesting about Rawls is he gives an argument for why that kind of inequality stands in need of justification and why too much inequality is a morally bad thing, right? You know, you would want equality from the original position because you might come out and find you're poor. You know, that is why this is significant. You know, it is a very clear argument for a position that's pretty common, especially on the left. And, and you know, I think there's some punch to this thought about inequality or, you know, even to people who might not be on the left or guys like Sanders wouldn't bring it up as sort of their, one of their main points, right? And, you know, 
unlike politicians, unlike guys like Sanders, you know, Sanders never gives us a clear criteria of how much inequality we should allow, how much is bad, you know, where our sort of red line is. Rawls does, right? Rawls says, if inequality doesn't allow real equality of opportunity, and if it is not to the benefit of the least well-off person, meaning if the least well-off person could be doing better, then that inequality isn't justified. Rawls gives us pretty clear criteria for how much inequality society can allow. And I think it's worth emphasizing both the real equality of opportunity principle and the difference principle would require major changes to our society. You know, what will we need to do to make sure that everybody has real equality of opportunity? I don't know, but if you sit and think for five minutes, you can probably think of dozens of ways that our society stands in the way of real equality of opportunity. Unequal funding for school districts, legacy admissions at colleges, you know, which we've already talked about. Lots of other stuff, too. Um, then, you know, we get to the difference principle itself. Even if we have real equality of opportunity, Rawls would say, well, we still need to make sure that any inequalities we have benefit the least well-off person, that the poorest person in society is doing as well as possible. Um, and look, you know, I don't know what that would look like, but I think it's pretty easy to say that there are plenty of inequalities in our society that don't benefit the least well-off, right? You know, if the president of Apple Computers is earning hundreds of millions of year, uh, dollars a year, I forget how much Tim Cook's earning, but it's a whole lot, you know, there's no plausible story you can tell how that benefits the least well-off person. You know, in a lot of states, you know, you have football coaches who are earning millions a year. I remember I used to work at Tennessee, and, you know, when I was there, they just signed this coach, Butch Jones. I forget for how many millions. Lo and behold, Butch Jones wasn't even very good at his job. But he still lost a lot of games, right? Um, he couldn't even do what he was hired for. He still got paid millions. When they fired him for being bad at his job, there was a clause in his contract where he got paid even more. You know, good work if you can get it, right? When you're fired for being incompetent, you get a payout. Um, but, you know, there's no way, even if this guy had actually been good at his job, where Rawls would ju say that that's justified. How does paying a football coach benefit the least well-off, right? And look, I don't think Rawls is stupid. Rawls wouldn't say that, oh, we have to go in and look at every single person's position, how much they're earning, you know, and ask if that benefits the least well off. But I think Rawls would say you could have way higher top tax rates. You know, look at somebody like Tim Cook, even if that benefited the least well off, you know, take somebody to pharmaceutical company, right? You know, the head of a pharmaceutical company earning a lot of money if that really leads to innovation, really gets us a coronavirus vaccine sooner, you know. I'm not going to begrudge the head of Pfizer, this guy Borla, his money. You know, great, I'm glad he's paid more than I am, right? But Rawls would ask, even for important people like Borla, well, look, he earns hundreds of millions, right? Do you think he's really going to work way less hard if he only earns two or three million a year? I don't think so, right? Would he really work that much less hard if he only got a lousy two million, three million a year? No, I think that's enough to encourage most people to work as hard as they can, right? So Rawls would say, you know, there's no way to justify people earning hundreds hundreds of millions. You don't need that as an incentive. There's no way that benefits the least well off. So you could tax that level of income very, very highly, and you can and should do things with it that would benefit the less well off. Okay, so hopefully you understand Rawls' position and what it means for society. Next lecture, 
we'll go into the objections to Rawls.